You behave. Good morning. How's the family this morning? Uh, we're a little short this morning. I think some of them thought the rain might melt them. I don't know. It felt good to get it, though. We did a little cooling. There you go. You're, that's right. I've seen your driveway. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we come to you this morning. We lift this day to you, Father. We're just thankful. Thankful for the blessings you provide, the favor you show on this church and this church family. And Father, we thank you for the rain. Father, uh, we're at a time when we need it. You know exactly what our needs are. And Father, I pray we'd be content with that. Father, I lift this day to you in a way that uh, I pray that you would just come in and sit among us. That you just uh, fill this building with your presence. Father, there's someone here today, I'm sure, seeking you or what you can do for them, Father, uh, anyone through those struggles. Be with us today. Just move me out of the way. Hide me behind the cross, Father. Let your uh, glory be revealed in everything we say, everything we do. We ask this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Well, I got props this morning. I know y'all like props. Uh-oh. <laughs> Don't you go there. Somebody actually gave that to me. I'm proud of that fish. It sits in my office all the time. No. I did I did just feed him though, and he's kind of content. I think so. <laughs> this week was fun for me and some others here in the church. Uh, because we had the opportunity to go fishing this weekend. We did a lot of fishing and I spent three days uh, this week camping and fishing down at Lake Whitney, which was kind of by myself, uh, just relaxing that my wife allowed me to go and do or encouraged me to go do. In fact, to get me out of the house, I guess. I'm not sure, but uh, had some guys here in the church came and spent some mornings with me, and we just had a good time. And Even though the fish catching part of it was a little slow, I guess mainly because of the heat, but... Uh, when we did catch one, it was a pretty good one. You just had to work at it a little bit, and that's part of it. And you know, a bass of this size would be a great that'd be a great catch for many fishermen. They'd be excited for a bass that size. I think something that big weighed close to ten pounds in real life. And but even with one this big, as a fisherman, you know, even me, I'd like to catch one just a little bit bigger. Even when you catch the biggest one. You're always striving to get one just a little bit bigger. Uh, never content at all with uh, what you've got. You, you know, and it's, it's that way in many things. It seems that many fishermen and women are only content with that great catch for just a little while. It just, till it wears off, you know, and you take the pictures and you hold it out real far so it'll look bigger than you. And, and you brag on it and you send all the pictures to all your friends and then all at once it's just... Nobody really cares anymore, right? Now, you carry that around like I do in my phone. I, I bet I've got more pictures of uh, fish in my phone than I do of my kids and my wife. <laughs> Priorities, right? <laughs> but you carry it around, and you're all excited about it, but then it starts to wear off, and that contentment goes away. You felt like you'd, you really accomplished something, and uh, that's important, but it wears off. And uh, I realize right now, and you do too, I'm just using fishing as an example here. The truth is that applies to many people in their lives today. It doesn't have to be fishing. It can be many things that people accomplish or many things people receive or many things people do. And they're content right then, just for a little bitty while. It doesn't last very long. Then they want more or something different. Always thinking the grass is greener. Somewhere else. So we find people doing that all the time. And throughout history, people always seem to want more. It's not just today's society. Maybe a little more so in today's society. But all through history, people always seem like they always wanted more. Even the people who seem to have everything. They seem to have everything you could want for themselves. But they're wanting things that are bigger, better, and more of it. Know anybody like that? I run into them all the time. And how much is enough? You ever thought about that? Go at that go through your mind. How much is actually enough? Some people believe that a bigger house, 
a nicer vehicle, nicer boat, or a lot of money will make them happy. They really believe that. Well, it might help, but it's only a temporary fix on this earth today. Benjamin Franklin said, money has never made man happy, nor will it. There is nothing in its nature to produce happiness. Some people don't believe that. They believe money is the root to happiness for them. And the more they can get, the happier they are. But once again, that's temporary here on earth. Amen. The more of it one has, the more of it he wants. I've run into a lot of people that way. Contentment is satisfaction, peace, assurance, and a sense of well-being cultivated by pursuing the right things in life. Amen. That's where you find contentment. And I find contentment more than anything else in peace in my life. And you may too. That's where contentment comes in. When you have peace in your life, there's not drama and turmoil going on every day in your life. If you can find that peaceful place, you can find a lot of contentment right there. I read a story about a man who became envious of his friends because they had a larger and more luxurious house. So he listed his house with a real estate firm, planning to sell it and to purchase a more impressive home. Shortly afterward, he was reading the classified section of the newspaper, and he saw an ad for a house that seemed just right for him. He promptly called the realtor and said, a house described in today's paper is exactly what I'm looking for. I would like to go through it as soon as possible. The agent asked him several questions about it, and then he replied, but sir, your house is the one you're describing in that. Can it be that way? Absolutely. He had, a, he had a great house, but he didn't even realize it until they pointed it out to him. And that's the way we are in life. There's a saying that says, a contented man is one who enjoys scenery along the detours. So sometimes when we have to take detours in our lives, do we enjoy the scenery or... Do we, we're not content with that. Me, if I get stuck in traffic and I have to detour, you know, I've learned to be content. I'm seeing something I haven't seen before. It wasn't always that way. Sometimes I was mad because I had to detour, right? But it's the perspective you use when you look at things. What brings contentment? You've got to find peace in all of it and every bit of it when you're doing that. And the, the problem with never being content can create in us selfish desires for our own personal satisfaction. We can become selfish. Even though we have it all, or we, people think we have it all, we can become selfish. Where we're not willing to give up anything. We're willing to try to gain more. Keeps turmoil in our lives. There is, though, a higher level of freedom from wanting that we have been blessed with. And in Christ, we have been set free from selfish desires. In Christ. So that we might become the person God wants us to be and enjoy the life Christ wants us to live. Wait a minute. Now, that means you gotta let, you got to let go. you got to give up control to God. Let Him control your life instead of you trying to control it. And let Him provide you with the things He knows you need, not all the things you want. Because we are a want society. Want, want, want. Hardly ever hear anybody say anymore, I need this. And when they do, they really don't need that. We can all find ourselves in that position very easily. We've been provided with a motto to live by that came from King David. That we can all lean on if we just would. King David in Psalms 23 verse 1 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And of course, that's in the King James Version. But I shall not want. If you have the Lord, why is the want? And that's what David is saying right here. That gives us something to lean on. Every time we figure out that we're not content, all we need is the Lord. If you turn with me this morning, we're going to be in Philippians. We're going to open up there. Philippians chapter 4, beginning at verse 12. Pray you brought your Bible once again. Let's take God's word for it, not mine. Let's look at it together. Philippians chapter 4, beginning at verse 12. This is Paul speaking right here. And he's speaking to the Philippians. And he's in prison. 
He says, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. And he goes on to say, yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. And what Paul's saying here, he, he appreciates the, their concern. The people, the Philippians, they were concerned about him being in prison, that he may not have everything that he needs or everything he wants. So, and they couldn't get gifts or they couldn't get anything to him. So he was telling them, I appreciate that. I really appreciate your concern for me. But he's telling them through this scripture the only contentment I'm really going to have, the only need I really have is going to be found in God, not in worldly things. So I don't need what all you're trying to offer me. I just need to make sure that I find my peace and my contentment in the Lord himself, right? And what a tremendous lesson we can learn right here from Paul, all of us. Tremendous lesson. Because the state we are in might not always be the most pleasant state to be in. We could be like Paul. Paul was in prison when he wrote this. He was chained 24 hours a day to a different guard. Each 24 hours, they would change guards. Each 24 hours, he got to visit with a different guard. And you know Paul... If he's content with the Lord and he's content where he is, probably these soldiers that he's being chained to, they can't figure this out. How can this guy be so calm and not uh, upset about this all the time? And he's getting in their ear, right? God's using him for what he's doing. He's getting in their ear and he's talking to them. And he's ministering to them to know the Lord and how he can be right where he's at. And the only way he could do that is find that contentment. In the Lord himself. When we see people like that, do we react that way? Or do we think, I need everything they got. I need to keep up with the Joneses. You know, I need that bigger house, that bigger car. I'm, you know, mine runs good and it didn't break down much. But do I need a new one? Can you be content right where you are? Well, I think that's, a, that's something we have to learn. It's learned behavior more than anything else. Even in the most uncomfortable consequences a person could be in, Paul found contentment. Simply Paul saying, it doesn't matter to me. I can live with it. I can live without it. I've learned to be content with it the way it is. I've learned to be content without it, even if it's not there. Whatever state God sees to put me in, I am content. Paul's saying all this because my life is in God's hands. It's not in mine. Each and every one of us here this morning, it's the same way. I know many of your names, Mike. That's your name, right? Nick? Lee? No y'all's names, right? No, no Brent over here on the end? He's hiding over there, but I know many people's names. There's some I don't know, some new faces here. But God knows every one of you, and he knows every one of you's name, and he loves every one of you the same. Nothing's different. He wants you to enjoy life, he wants you to have joy, and he wants you to have contentment. But he knows your name, and he knows all about you. Do you know his name, and do you know all about him? Why would he want to know all about us? The Bible tells us he knows every hair on our head. He knows all about us. Knew us before we were born. So he knows us intimately. Do we know him intimately? I guess the question is, do we want to know him intimately? If you want contentment in your life, that's where you need to be. You need to have an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ daily. Daily. That's what brings contentment in your life. Paul knew that God was in control of these things that surrounded him. He knew he didn't have any control over it. Being chained 24 hours a day, you're pretty locked down, right? He knew he didn't have any control over that. He knew he wasn't going to be able to battle these Roman guards. But being in their ear and ministering to them, I'm sure each and every one of them, 
made his life a little bit easier. And God was using him as a tool. But on the other hand, that tool was helping him so much for life to be a little bit easier in prison. And the guys he got in their ears, they may be, as, it doesn't say, but they might have been supplying him with some of the things he needed that you don't normally get in prison. Amen? Because he was obedient to God. And he knew God was in control of what was going on in his life. And he also knew that God was using him for his purpose and his will. Paul shared with us the secret of wanting nothing more than the basics. He shares that. His state of mind had been conditioned to desire nothing more than what was essential for living. His mind was conditioned. And that's what hurts us. Satan loves to play around in the head, right? And the mind's probably the devil's playground for sure. And your mind's what controls everything you do, everything you say. It controls all that. It controls your thinking. And if we let Satan get into our head that we've got to have bigger, better, more, we're never going to be content. Paul was saying that freedom from wants has nothing to do with self-sufficiency. Has nothing to do with it at all. Freedom from wants, think about that. It has nothing to do with self-sufficiency. But it has everything to do with God's sufficiency. For Paul's claim, and it, you, it's, it, it was right here in Scripture, Paul claimed that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That was a reality. That wasn't a fantasy. He believed it. Do we believe that? Or is it just a fantasy? Or is it just a story? Or is it made up? I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. I believe that. Of course, I believe everything in the Bible. And I've been questioned on that a couple of times. How can you believe that? That's impossible. Nothing's impossible for God. Contentment, we can say, is a learned skill. A practice for the Christian. Have you ever practiced being content? How do you do that? It's learned. Think about a person that has no shoes. Are they content? They probably are if they see a person that has no feet. Amen? You can find contentment in everything. You just have to look and appreciate where you are. For Paul says in, in verse 12, I have learned the secret, learned the secret of being content, no matter the situation. It's a secret. I have, but let, go back to the word. I have learned the secret. He doesn't say anything else about it that that's just the way he is. He says, I have learned the secret. So that's telling me right there that we need to learn. We need to learn to be more content with where we are. And be more content with God than the worldly things in our lives. Because all those worldly things in our lives are going to stay right here when we leave this earth. Amen. Paul had a contentment because he had confidence in the Lord's providence. He trusted God with everything. That's hard for everybody today. It's hard for many of us. To just trust God with everything. Because we always want to control. We always want to make sure we're in control of it. And when God doesn't do what we want, we're going to go around him and we're going to try to do what we want. And what happens when that you do that? Normally it winds up in a big mess. Most of the time. That we try to go around God. And there's a lot of people that try to go around God. Because his timing's not our timing. We want it now, right now, today. And we want it bigger and better and more of it. And the only way we can get that sometimes is trying to go around God. And then the train wreck starts. You say, how's that work? Well, God knows what we need. So if we go out and buy a bigger boat, or we go buy a bigger house or a bigger car, and then we find ourselves in debt up to here, then there's no contentment. We're miserable again, right? How do you find contentment in that? 
God knows what we need. So find contentment in him first and pray about everything before you make decisions on things. Pray about it. Romans chapter 8, verse 28, if you turn with me there. Paul believed that nothing comes to us except by God's hand. Nothing came to him except by God's hand. That was Paul's strong belief. That he was going to receive nothing unless it came from God's hands. And Roman 8, chapter 8, verse 28 says, And we know that all things God, in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. All things work for the good of those who love him. So if you love the Lord, and all things are for God's good, for his good, then why would we not trust him to provide us with what we need and more than what we want? Paul also knew he had strength. He had all the strength he needed through the Lord's power because we don't even have one drop of the power that God is. I mean, even though we're told that if we have the faith of a mustard seed, which is very, very small, Right? But all our power comes from God. All of it. And Paul knew that all he needed was God's power and the strength from God to get through everything that he was going through. He knew that. And in Philippians 4.13, that's where he says, I can do all this through him who strengthens me. He understands that everything, his strength, his being, his own being came from God himself, not anybody else. And nobody else was going to bring him peace in his life. Nobody else was going to bring him comfort in his life. Nobody. We think that sometimes. We think we can find contentment with others. That they're going to bring contentment in our lives. Things are going to bring contentment in our lives. It doesn't work that way. You find peace within. And you got to find it through the Lord. Paul also found comfort in the Lord's presence. He knew the Lord was with him in everything he did. Even there in prison, he found comfort in, the presence, in his presence, which he revealed in Philippians uh, chapter 1, verse 21, when he said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So he, he didn't care about his life. He really didn't because it belonged to the Lord. So for him to die was gain. So he didn't sit in fear all the time. Many of us do. We all need to be concerned about dying, but I don't think there's a, a fear there. We've seen a lot of that in the last year. The fear of dying. Well, I have some news for you. You're all going to die sooner or later. There ain't no way out of it. But where you live after that life, you have some control over. Amen. Heaven or hell, there's no in-between. There's no halfway and there's no God grading on the, uh, on the, on the, on the edge there that he's going to, on the curve, that you're going to get into heaven just because you did something good or that you're a good person. If you believe that, you're out of line because the Bible tells us that our works aren't going to get us into heaven. And all our possessions and all the great things we have with no contentment, it's going to, not going to get us into heaven. What did they say? You've never seen a luggage rack on a hearse? They ain't taking it with them, right? Our contentment, everything's going to come from the Lord itself. I think Paul's comfort came from knowing that Jesus Christ was with him. All the way to the end of his life. Because he had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And he didn't want that personal relationship when it all started out, right? He's on the road to Damascus. He's just, he's just going around just murdering and destroying Christians everywhere. When Jesus shows up and goes, no, 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 this ain't going to work. And he strikes him down blind. He gets his attention, right? So after that, he 
you realize he needs a relationship with Jesus Christ. Do we need to be struck blind to figure out we need a relationship with Jesus Christ? I don't think so. Take that back. There are some people. Two before to the back of the head might help a little bit sometimes too. Hey, excuse me, Lord. I'm sorry. You do it a different way. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 13, get at verse 5. Hebrews chapter 13, beginning at verse 5 says, Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Paul was content because of those words right there. He knew that Jesus Christ was with him all the way to the end of his life. So he found contentment in that. And we get strength for contentment from outside of ourselves. Think about that, outside of ourselves. You go, how does that work? It's not something that we find in ourselves. We have to look outside ourselves to Jesus Christ. For it is through the Holy Spirit of Christ that gives us power and gives us strength. Jesus Christ himself, through the Holy Spirit. If you've accepted Christ, been baptized, you know what that's like. You know that day that the Holy Spirit just took over. That you were just filled with it. And probably on that day when you were filled with the Holy Spirit at that time, you were content right then. Saying, oh man, this is going to be good. I think I found the contentment I'm looking for. And then what happens? You walk out the doors and Satan steps in. And starts getting in your ear, just like Paul getting in these, these Roman soldiers here. Here's Satan getting in our ears saying, hey, you need more. You're good. You need to go after it now. You don't need this Jesus Christ. You need me. You need to listen to me. I'm going to help you get more. Remember what he told Paul? I mean, he told Jesus standing on the, on the, the, the mount there. He told all the mountains overlooking everything. This can all be yours if you just bow down and worship me. Satan's telling us that every day. This can all be yours, but you gotta, you got to get away from that Jesus guy. you got to get over in my pasture. I can show you contentment he's not giving you. And I'll do it now. I'll give it to you right now. I'm not going to wait. It's not, it's, it's, it's not my timing. It's yours. Come on. Satan's telling us that every day. And many times we'll find ourselves jumping on board. Make a mess of it. Break the glass and then call God and clean it up. Hey, we need some help. We made a mess here. How many times do we do that over and over again? I have a couple of uh, gloves here. You may be wondering. These are pretty rough. I've used these a few times. But you know the thing about these gloves... They cannot do anything by themselves. Anything at all. They can lay there on the table or lay on a workbench or right around in the door of my truck. But they can't do anything at all by themselves. They're useless just laying around collecting dust. And when I put my hand in one of them, or my brother's hand. <laughs> the glove can do so many things by me putting my hand in it. It's not the glove itself, but my hand in the glove. It takes the action, amen? And if we put on two gloves, that's even more. More work can be done. These work gloves have been with me a long time, believe it or not. So they're not worn out. That tells you I don't work that much with them. <laughs> My brother will agree. But with these gloves on, I can do all sorts of things. You know, I can hammer nails. 
pull and clear brush if you've ever done that. Poked a few times, not having gloves on. Handle sharp and heavy objects and many other tasks you can do once you put on a good pair of gloves. It's kind of like the church. We always say that if you have a good pair of gloves that fit, a good pair of boots, you'll wear them. If they don't fit and they're uncomfortable, they don't work, you don't use them. Church is the same way. You find the church that you're comfortable with, just like your gloves or your boots, you'll wear it. You'll show up. and You'll connect with the Lord. Start to do more things for Him. Once again, we all know that it isn't the gloves that would be in the, doing the work. It would be my brother's hands doing the work. Because he'd be wearing the gloves. <laughs> he does a lot. I also have a new pair of gloves. Just bought these this morning. So those aren't worn out. You go, why would you buy a new pair? Well, they're for a good example. They haven't been used at all. Yeah, they're for my brother. That's a good one. I have a choice here. I can put my hands in these gloves and go to work. Or I can just lay them on the side and allow them to do nothing also. These are new Christians. They don't know what to do yet. They're brand new. They don't know whether to put their hands in them or just let them lay. But once you come to know Jesus Christ, you know what to do. Your hand is the Holy Spirit. It goes in this glove and it starts to work. That's what it means to be a Christian. And for God to put his Holy Spirit in us is exactly what happens. Once we become a Christian and God instills his Holy Spirit in us, we go to work. We go to work for Jesus Christ. We go to work as an example, doing God's will for his purpose. And God's not giving us a long list of things that we must do to serve him. Don't think that. God's not giving us a long list to do that. Left to, up to ourselves, though, and our own strength and abilities, we'd never pull it off. Everything that he wanted us to do, amen? We couldn't do it with our own strength. So God works in us and gives us the ability to do things he wants us to do, the things that please him. So he works through us. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. And then this is in the NLT version because I liked it a little bit better, a little bit clearer. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. We backed it up with scripture right there, right? It's not my words, it's God's words. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5, let's look at that piece of Scripture. I know, I'm beating everybody up with Scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5 says, Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. Amen. Now, I found this in the uh, CEV, which is the contemporary version, and it defines it a little bit better for all of us to understand because sometimes that can be a little confusing. So I thought I'd go a little deeper in which it says this. We don't have the right to claim that we have done anything on our own. God gives us what, what it takes to do all that we do. That's a lot clearer, amen? We don't have the right to claim. We've done anything on our own, but we do, don't we? We did it all. It was all because of us, right? We don't have that right to claim that because without God's strength and power and his will, we wouldn't get it done anyway. 
A Christian is a glove. That's why I brought gloves today. And it is the, it is the Holy Spirit in us, the hand, who does the work, right? Good analogy, I thought. I hope you get it. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16. Should be close right there. Just flip back a couple of pages if you were in Philippians. New Testament. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through the, his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we asked or imagined, according to his power that is at work within us. The Holy Spirit goes to work in us. You know, the Holy Spirit's kind of your, like your conscience, too. It works on you the same way. I think the thing we must remember more so than anything else that the glove needs to allow the hand to have full access. All the spaces in the glove need to be filled or the glove will be ineffective, right? You ever shove your hand in one and you couldn't get your thumb to go in the side deal or one finger to go in, right? It wasn't going to do you any good. It irritated you for one, right? So we need to make sure that we allow God's Holy Spirit to have full access to our heart, to our minds, that we may do the things to please God, His will, and learn to be content with what we have in our lives. Our relationship with God is a daily surrender. Daily we have to surrender our lives to God. A giving of all that we are Every day to God. Give it all to God. You've heard that over and over again. And that's true. Surrender to God daily. Talk to God daily. He wants to hear from you. You don't need no cell phone. You can talk to him right there where you're sitting right now without dialing a thing. Right? Even when the Wi-Fi is bad, he hears you. Right? I guess my question to you this morning is, where do you find contentment? That's something you have to say to yourself, figure out yourself. That's between you and God. Is it in worldly things? Or is it in Jesus Christ? You have to determine that. I would suggest if you're finding more contentment in worldly things, it's temporary. If you want a lifelong contentment, find it in Jesus Christ. Don't misunderstand me here, though. I know I don't want you to walk out here with any kind of misunderstanding. It's okay to desire nice things in our lives. There's nothing wrong with that. But let's learn to be content with what the Lord provides and pray for His favor and the other things we need, right? Put it on Him, not on us. I don't think any of us would regret that. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we come to you once again just thankful and humble. Father, we thank you for your presence here today that we know fills this building. Thank you for just coming to sit among us. I pray, Father, that you might be just sitting there tapping on somebody's shoulder. Let them know you're there. That you're ready to help them with that contentment in their lives. There might be somebody here that's just going through a lot of stuff. You know, it's just wearing them out. They just can't find peace in their lives. And Father, there may be someone here today that just does not know you. And if you're that person today and you're looking for some peace and you're looking for some contentment, you're looking for a change in your life, then would you pray with me this morning? You can pray silently, pray out loud. You pray however you would like to pray, but pray in this way. Father God, come into my heart. Father, I need some contentment and peace and joy in my life again. And Father, I accept you this morning as my Lord and Savior. 
I believe you sent your son to die on the cross to cover my shortcomings and sins in my life. And starting this morning, I connect, commit my life to you. And I'll give you full control. Father, we love you and we praise you. We give the glory to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you said that...